I would like to welcome <laughs> Brian Hoblet from CFV Capital Partners. Brian Hoblet is the vice president and brings a strong experience in operations, management, and capital sourcing for small to mid-sized businesses. In his role as commercial lender, Brian Hoblet helped middle market companies, including private equity firms and their portfolio clients, grow via debt financing and other strategic initiatives to fa facilitate their success. Brian is also on the board of Clean Start and we are always eager to hear him talk and hear his perspective on the future of investing in, and what's impacting it. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and let Brian take over. So while, while Thomas is, is putting that up, um, this is gonna be a refresh of a talk that I gave uh, on April 17th, 2020, which was, uh, if everyone can remember a time of just incredible uncertainty in the market and so what we knew then and what we know now are two completely different things. And so this is going to be a refresh in about how uh, the $5.1 trillion of stimulus has gone into the economy and what that's going to do with um, how that's going to impact businesses and how that's also going to impact startups and entrepreneurs as they're looking for investments. Um, excellent. Thomas, next slide. So this is effectively what I just said. So uh, two points on this slide as a disclaimer. These are my thoughts. These are not the thoughts of CVF Capital Partners. CVF Capital Partners is a middle market investing firm. We invest in companies um, that have strong cash flows. We do not do venture investments, um, but we will invest in, in middle market companies, typically in the Western half of the United States. The, the second and third bullet point, this is the reason I'm literally re uh redisclaiming i guess is that uh in april march and april of last year we had no idea what was going on it was a very uncertain time and that kind of informed some of the decisions that were made in terms of investment so unprecedented times and there were numerous operational pickups in terms of some of the government stimuluses that were going out so um i just wanted to inform everyone on where we were you know 12 months ago uh, in terms of how this impacted everything. Next slide, Thomas. So the goal for this for this uh, this webinar is, I just wanna talk about at a high level, what all this money is going to do, both for businesses and the investing community. I'm gonna to try to keep politics out of this. Um, I, I have some family members on here and I tend to piss everyone off anytime I talk about politics. So I'm not <laughs> going to. <laughs> Um, it, it, and then ultimately, what is what is going to be the impact of, of the capital that is going into the uh, into the market? So there's going to be some certainly some positives from the American Rescue Plan, and there's going to be some uh, longer term, maybe not unknown impacts as well in terms of tax implications and some other things uh, along each of those. Next slide, Thomas. Again, back to where we were uh, 12 months ago. Uh, the, the one stat that I love is the San Francisco Fed on March 7th. This is four days before what I call ground zero of the pandemic uh, on March 11th. March 11th was when the NBA suspended their season. It's when Tom Hanks and, uh, and Rita Wilson announced that they, had, um, uh, that, they, that they had COVID and kind of the whole world stopped within about a one hour period. But four days before that, the San Francisco Fed said that the labor market was so strong that they thought that GDP was gonna be consistent going forward. In fact, a week before that, um, the, the forecast by Wells Fargo was 2.4%. It fell off a cliff over the next couple of weeks. This was just a time of complete uncertainty. Next slide. So one other, one other thing that, that we did when I gave this talk on April 17th last year is, is we did an analysis on what we thought um, was going to happen in 2020. Um, and, and we looked at seven different metrics. So uh, how did we do? Huh? You know, actually, actually pretty good. There was so much uncertainty, but we, we actually did okay. So uh, GDP, first of all, GDP last year was a negative 3.5%. What does that mean? That was the worst GDP that we've had since 1946. So it was absolutely, it absolutely cratered the economy in some respects. Um, Personal consumption is interesting. We did a talk um, uh, with Weintraub on April 2nd, where we said personal consumption was gonna be positive. And the two weeks following that, we said it was gonna be negative, directionally correct uh, on that. 
the two misses that we had were on unemployment. Uh, we didn't put a, a strong number on this. We just said it's going to be greater than 10%. Uh, it actually was 8.1%. It's now in the high sixes. Uh, I'm going to call that a miss, although I think we're directionally correct on that because uh, the unemployment number does not include people who are underemployed, um, et cetera. The S&P, we, we kind of missed that a lot. There was some investments in some tech funds uh, or some of the tech companies ended up doing quite well and ended up booing the entire market. If you take that out, the market was relatively flat. We actually had it going down. Um, so we missed on, 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 that, uh, uh, on that metric. Thomas, next slide. So uh, here's where we are right now. In the last 13 months, $5.1 trillion has gone into the market. So what's that, how's that going to impact businesses? Well, I have a colleague who describes the economy as a sponge, and there's only so much water you can put into a sponge. So that excess water is capital that's going to be out there that is going to be available for entrepreneurs, um, and it's going to be available for, for businesses, but it's also going to cause some other issues in terms of hiring. So uh, first, under the CARES Act, that was a $2.3 trillion um, uh, stimulus. The PPP, the, the Paycheck Protection Program, which was implemented, it had so many hiccups coming out of, uh, uh, out of the gate uh, that you'd almost have to say that it was a failure. To us, it was a huge success. We're going to look back on this historically and say that despite all the hiccups, and I mean, even today, they, we have some of our portfolio companies that don't know if their, uh, if their PPP has have been forgiven or not, but it kept these companies in business and it kept people, uh, it kept people working. It's going to be, it's ultimately going to be a huge, uh, a, a huge thing. So, um, but that $5.1 trillion that has been approved in the last 13 months, to put that in perspective, during the four years of World War II, inflation adjusted, the U.S. spent $4.1 trillion on World War II. It's a lot of money. If you include the $2.3 trillion uh, American jobs plan that, that Biden announced last week, we're more than a third of our stabilized uh, GDP. It's a lot of money that has gone into the, uh, that has gone in. In addition, most of the pundits think that it's gonna be another trillion dollars or so in soft funds that are gonna be coming out. So you're looking at 40% or so of GDP just in government stimulus in a year and a half. It's a lot of money. Next slide. So uh, the, the only reason I, I, I present this is there, there were really three main uh, stimulus packages that have been done in the last uh, uh, 13 months. So first, and uh, the CARES Act, 55% of that money went to businesses and in the American Rescue Plan, 53% went to individuals. So. You can argue what is better, how much of it goes to businesses and how much trickles down, um, or what goes to individuals and how much they're going to spend. Uh, it's just a different kind of philosophy on, on, both, of these, uh, on both of these plans. Uh, next slide, Thomas. So this is, this is one of the things, and this is possibly a controversial slide, but under the CARES Act from March, uh, April of last year, uh, they had a $600 federal unemployment assistance that was given out that uh, sunsetted on July 31st. If you include in California um, $300 per week, that equates to about a $22.5 per hour job um, for not working. So are there impacts to companies on that? Of course there are. So real world example, one of our portfolio companies, a, a transportation company, um, our driver pool increased 11% after July 31st, once the federal uh, stimulus package sunsetted. So if you're a business, does all this money going into the uh, economy help? Yes, in one respect, but in the second respect, it might be harder, harder to find uh, some workers. Under the American Rescue Plan, that $600 federal uh, unemployment went down to uh, $300. So that equates both from federal and state to about a $15 uh, an hour um, job. So that is gonna have impact on businesses. So finally, in summary, and you know, this, this was a recast of a presentation that we did on how this is gonna impact businesses. I'm, I'm gonna transition. Uh, next slide, Thomas. 
I'm going to transition my summary slide into how this really impacts the investing community. So I have kind of five takeaways and what all this capital is, is going to do. So first, $5.1 trillion is a lot of money that has gone in. And so there's going to be some impacts both short term. Uh, personal consumption is going to go up. Um, GDP, I, I didn't focus on this in one of the earlier slides, is forecasted to be anywhere from what we've seen is six to eight and a half percent. The biggest GDP growth we've ever had since World War II is 7.4% in 1984. There's a chance we're gonna eclipse that. So the, the growth in the economy is gonna be absolutely enormous. Uh, two, there is absolutely pent up demand for companies or for institutions to invest into the private markets. For us at CVF, we hit the pause button for about six months last year, investing our capital into companies because we wanted to make sure that all our companies were adequately capitalized and that they could make it through uh, the pandemic in this area of complete unknown. We now have to make up for 2020 by investing in 2020 and 2021 and 2021. So if you're a company that's going out to try to, to get capital, now's a great time to do it. Um, number three, because of the stimulus that has gone directly to individuals, it might be a challenge finding workers. There is an incentive for workers, for people not to work because of the amount of individual stimulus. Uh, number four, uh, all this, all this $5.1 trillion is gonna have to be paid for by something. So um, the American jobs plan that, that the infrastructure plan that, that uh, Biden announced last week has said that coming with this is going to be higher taxes, both for individuals and for corporations. Uh, it also means there's going to be higher capital gains taxes, which is going to impact the um, investing community. And then five, the infrastructure bill will help out some entrepreneurs. So in that, there's going to be $180 billion for research and development, whatever that means, $100 billion for improving the digital infrastructure, and $621 billion for transportation, including electric vehicles. So if you're in this space, there is gonna be some money coming into your particular segments of, of, of the economy. So in conclusion, if you're an entrepreneur and if you're looking for capital, don't miss the boat. 2021 is almost the best time ever to try to get an investment from a company like ours or for a venture capital firm. There's a lot of capital that's out there that needs to be deployed and taxes are going to go up sometime in the future. So you wanna make sure you uh, take advantage of everything right now. And that's my presentation, Thomas. Great, thank you very much, Brian. Um, so the tax part of how do we pay for all of this? Uh, certainly some suggestions have been if we just spend $30 billion hiring more IRS agents, um, they would produce some multiple of that investment in increased tax revenue and not change the tax rates at all. That doesn't seem to be sufficient to cover the enormity of the amount that we've laid out. But what, what, what's your view on sort of the slack in the current system uh, that we're, we're under collecting uh, what the current system produces? Have you thought about that? Uh no, it's, it's a great question. Um, I, I personally, I don't think hiring more tax collectors is going to make up a third of GDP. That hole is just too big. Um, I mean, one thing that, that in, one thing that Biden is proposing is a minimum tax on all corporations of 15%. Um, you know, one of the reasons that Amazon does not pay tax right now is because they have these net operating losses from the investments that they made that turned out to be good investments, but they were losing money for the first 20 years of their existence. So you, you can't argue that that was a bad use of our, of our tax funds because ultimately once those NOLs go away, they're gonna start making, they're gonna start producing an enormous tax revenue stream um, for the US government. So what's the balance there? I don't know. Um, but there is a balance at, at some level. So that minimum 15%, that, that might make sense. It is, it, you know, it's something like 20% of the Fortune 500 companies don't pay taxes right now. Um, and, and maybe that's too much, but you have to balance 
trying to spur innovation through these allowing NOLs versus uh, making sure all companies are paying, you know, quote unquote, their fair share in taxes. That's yet. Yeah, we're going to have a good discussion on that in a second. Uh, one thing that I want everyone to kind of focus on, though, also that you had mentioned is the infrastructure plan, which is highly focused on um, fighting climate change, which is clean technologies and investing in them, um, whether it's in R&D stages or um, ones that are more market ready uh, now. So uh, keep your eyes open for that. And now I would like to welcome Andrew McCarthy from Weintraub. Tobin, he's going to highlight if you're a startup, you know, what do you need to do to stay investment ready and um, basically ready to go to get funding so that you can go after hopefully stimulus money or other grants from the government or private equity. Hi, guys. Good morning. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, Thomas. Um, that was an interesting uh, bit of material that Brian presented about where we were and what's happened in the meantime. And and what's likely to happen with the investment environment and, and also the tax uh, rates and the structure and uh, maybe uh, getting uh, closing some loopholes for uh, corporations to, to move their tax revenues offshore. And, and especially the, the stimulus money that's pouring in to the economy. I think just like Brian said, it, it's going to um, inevitably lead to um, capital that's going to be available to be deployed into uh, companies of all sizes at all stages of development, including uh, startup companies, and particularly in the, the clean tech space with, um, with just the, the emerging interest in these companies, as well as uh, the support these companies are probably going to get uh, from, from the government and from government spending and tax incentives as well. So today I'm going to talk about um, uh, what companies need to do to be investment ready. And I'm sort of going to work backwards from uh, talking about the types of investors out there and the types of investments. And then I'll end up talking more about what the company should be thinking about, what the founders, the managers should be uh, keeping in mind uh, just to keep things tidy, uh, so to speak, and uh, to keep the company and uh, the management in a position and the owners in a position to talk to investors if, if they want to raise capital. So to break it down into two categories uh, here, there are investors and there's types of investments. And um, there's also, you can look at it in the stages of development of the company and the stages of fundraising. So there's uh, what you might call a seed round, friends and family rounds, which is just getting the company off the ground, uh, helping the founders to maybe quit their day jobs. Um, and then it moves to outside investors of usually increasing uh, dollar amounts. Um, talking about friends and family, so many times that's just the founders themselves putting in money. Uh, they're family and friends, their personal networks. Um, and also there's the whole universe of angel investors out there, wealthy individuals who um, may be full-time or just as a hobby uh, invest in uh, companies. And often these angel investors, as they're called, have uh, networks and their own contacts. And if you can develop, as a founder, if you develop a relationship with an angel investor, sometimes that can lead to contacts with uh, their colleagues, their friends, their network, and sometimes they even have small funds of themselves. And beyond that, not on this slide, but there are firms um, uh, such as CVF and funds and venture capital funds. Um, but I think that's, that's a later uh, stage in the fundraising process than what I'm mostly fo focusing on here. Um, in terms of the dollar amount, now there are these rough labels. I wouldn't put too much stock in these labels, such as seed round, uh, series A, series B. Um, but if you're talking about a seed round, I think what most people are probably talking about is $50,000 to $2 million, usually less than uh, $3 million. And if you're talking about more than $1 million, often the type of investment uh, is an equity investment. Whereas before that, 
a lot of time you have uh, convertible notes or simple agreements for uh, future equity safes, which uh, we'll talk about, I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, in terms of the number of investors, well, if you're talking about $10,000 to $50,000 each, you could be looking at, you know, anywhere from one to 10 investors to get to what the company wants to raise. And when you're talking about, you know, 10 or more investors, um, sometimes wrangling all those folks can be difficult. So uh, many times these rounds are set up with um, rolling closings. So all the money doesn't change hands and all the the issuance of whatever instrument or securities the company is selling doesn't happen on one day. It can happen, for instance, over the course of a month. And then once uh, the company reaches whatever target it wants or thinks it's gonna raise, um, that's the round. And the closings can happen on any number of days and, and the documents will be uh, set up that way. Um, so in terms of the types of investments you've got, these are just some examples of uh, pretty much the most common ones you'll see. Uh, the top two, convertible notes, simple agreements for future equity. These are instruments where the company gives them to the investor, the investor gives the company money. And this document, this instrument gives the investor the right to receive shares like equity uh, of some kind of shares of stock upon a triggering event, a conversion event. For instance, and this is what investors are most, most often looking for, a next big equity financing. Um, and so for instance, if a big venture capital fund comes in, invests uh, an amount, many times that's specified in these convertible instruments like $1 million or $2 million or often five to $10 million. That will trigger the conversion of the safe or the convertible note into equity. And the conversion price is key. That tells you how many shares of stock the uh, convertible instrument holder will get in exchange for uh, what they initially spent to get the convertible instrument. So, um, and then you've got convertible preferred stock. That's the most standard type of equity security that's in a round where um, a big, usually a big investor comes in. There's an idea of how much the company is worth and that enterprise value is implied by the price per share that, uh, the uh, investor is paying for their shares. Um, and that also relates to how much, like basically what percentage of the company that big investor wants to own after they put in their money, the post money uh, valuation. So all those pieces are tied together, the price per share, the implied value of the whole company, uh, uh, that's a result of that price per share and um, the percentage of the company that the preferred stock investor wants to own after the round. Um, so here's kind of the, the meat of uh, my uh, content here. And um, these are just some things that a founder or anyone who is thinking about who runs a company, who started it, and is thinking about taking money from third party unrelated investors, um, these are things you might wanna think about. Um, and it starts with the type of legal entity. If you're a founder, uh, you may not have yet uh, formed an entity and that's fine. Then you're, uh, in that case, you're a sole proprietor, but often as things uh, progress and you're thinking about um, entering into more contracts maybe uh, signing a lease for a real property, you're gonna wanna have a legal entity. Uh, and the biggest reason for doing that is to limit your liability, to have that entity on the hook uh, instead of you. In case some creditors come after your business, um, someone slips and falls, anyone who might have a claim against your business, you want them to have a claim against 
your business, the entity, uh, and not you. Um, and in terms of the type of entity, so there's, I would, I would split things in uh, between cor corporations, C corporations, or pass through entities. And in the world of uh, pass through entities, the idea is that all the income, the loss, everything that the business makes gets passed up to the owners. Um, I'll call them partners, but it can be a partnership, but it can also be an LLC. And S Corps are also another type of, um, of pass through entity, it, which is basically a corporation that elects to be treated as an S corporation for, uh, for federal income tax purposes. Um, and there, so there's still C corporations for many purposes, but for purposes of federal income tax, the items uh, of gain, loss, uh, income uh, pass through to the owners. Um, now, so if, if, you, if you haven't started an entity yet and you're just looking for the easiest way to uh, form an entity, um, an LLC is probably a good bet. They're very flexible, they're relatively low cost and low maintenance compared to all the formalities um, that you might have to follow uh, if you had formed a corporation, for instance. Um, they're flexible in the sense that you can um, uh, decide how to share losses and profits if there's more than one of you. If you're the only owner, then you're, it's a single member uh, LLC. And if, if you're an owner of an LLC, either by yourself or with other owners slash members, members is what they're called, um, you can convert into a corporation relatively easy, easily. Uh, it's a little more costly, a little more painful to go from corporation uh, into LLC uh, many times if you have a uh, built-in game. Basically, it's once you have a corporation and that corporation starts making money, and it builds up earnings and profits, it's very hard to extract those profits and those items, those pieces of property, those assets with built-in gain. It's hard to take it out of that corporation without the corporation itself being subject to tax and then having the shareholders being subject to tax as well. So um, that's why a lot of times younger companies uh, uh, start as an LLC. Now, of course, uh, many big companies also remain as LLCs as well. Um, but in terms of getting down the road, if you're looking for a venture capital investment, many times uh, those investors want uh, to invest in a corporation. So that's one reason why um, you may need to convert into a corporation um, later. Um, so the next thing you'll see is uh, protecting brand names, basically. Uh, this is just all about IP. Uh, before you invest in the name of your company, uh, logos, you wanna do some trademark searches, make sure that's not already taken. And in terms of IP strategy, that's a kind of a broader umbrella of things you wanna think about. And that includes um, having uh, intellectual property assignment agreements, invention assignment agreements, confidentiality agreements with your employees, your service providers, um, as well as potential uh, business uh, partners or, or uh, like co-venturers or other entities that you might want to do business with, have things to protect your intellectual property, spell out that you continue to own what you own, um, and to uh, give you rights in the event that you find out that someone is misusing uh, intellectual property that's yours. Um, labor and employment laws. So uh, the big one there is classification of independent contractors versus employees. Um, independent contractors traditionally are people who uh, run their own business, control what they do, how they do it. You hire them for one job. Uh, you, you don't, in California, this, is, this has been the subject of um, a lot of development and case law recently. So um, it's, it's much harder to classify someone as an independent contractor now in California as a result of those laws. And uh, another thing uh, 
another basically requirement that the company has to meet who's engaging an independent contractor uh, to get services from them is that if the company wants to classify that person as an independent contractor, the company can't be in the business of providing the service that the independent contractor is providing to the company. Um, so uh, why does this matter? It's basically wage and hour laws and benefits. Independent contractors are entitled to minimum wage, time off, breaks, whereas exempt employees, more white collar employees um, are not entitled to those same benefits. So you just wanna make sure you are classifying people, uh, service providers in a way that they are classified under the law, regardless of any label that anyone puts on them um, so that you're, you're complying with wage and hour laws and, uh, and similar uh, requirements there. Um, Equity-based compensation. This is one area where you probably want the advice of an attorney um, or even an accountant that's uh, uh, experienced with these issues. And by equity-based compensation, I mean stock options, stock appreciation rights, uh, restricted stock. It can be a great way to compensate and incentivize uh, your, your officers of your company and to hire people like that. Uh, without paying them uh, money right now. Um, but you have to do it. Everyone has to be aware of the tax implications of that um, because it has uh, uh, equity-based compensation uh, brings up issues that are related to tax um, for both the service provider as well as the company. And uh, if you, as the company, adopt an equity incentive plan, um, if you set aside, say, 20%, 10%, whatever, of your um, total authorized uh, stock uh, to be issued to service providers under your equity incentive plan, uh, potential investors will care about that because when that's issued, um, that's going to dilute their percentage of ownership. A um, couple more items here. Uh, if you have a website... Um, you want to think about uh, the privacy policy and the terms of use for the website. Um, those are two basic things that you probably should have if it's anything beyond just like a business card that's online. And especially if you're collecting information, data, personal information from people who visit your site, you're going to want uh, terms of use and a privacy policy. And if you're collecting a lot of data, if that's what your business is built on, you probably want to think about a cyber insurance and, uh, of course, implementing measures that uh, safeguard the data uh, and handle it in a way um, that's consistent with how you're saying to the world that you handle that data. Um, and lastly, uh, documenting relationships with all sorts of people. Um, Documenting the company's relationship with founders is important, especially when it comes to uh, what the founders have contributed. For instance, intellectual property or money or equipment. You wanna make sure if that was just a loan, it's reflected as loan. If you wanna make sure, if you want that to be uh, reflected as um, a contribution of the capital of the company in exchange for membership units or stock, you wanna make sure uh, that's reflected as well. Um, and in terms of uh, this also ties when you're talking about service providers, um, if you're engaging an independent contractor, you want to make sure you're able to actually call them that and then use an independent contractor agreement, make sure they're assigning any intellectual property that they create to the company so that you own it. So you make sure that they can't come back later and say they own uh, what they made for your company. Um, and this is, uh, that's basically the list. And to tie this all together, um, you can think about it as if, if you do all these things, uh, expecting to take money from investors, potentially one day, um, think of it as if you were about to sell your business. You want everything very clear. Um, you wanna make sure you can uh, demonstrate that you've complied with laws and that all your uh, relationships are, are properly uh, documented. Lastly, securities laws. Um, 
under federal and state securities laws, um, whenever a party sells a security, um, these are regulated transactions by statute and by regulations. And um, basically, anytime you take money in exchange for the promise of profits being kicked out to whoever you took the money from, generated from your business, that's a security. And um, under federal law and state law, uh, definitely federal law and most state laws, as long as it's, there's not a public offering and you're talking to just one or two people, you're probably fine. So that's the most basic summary I can give you there. Um, but if you're out in the public trying to raise money from many people you don't know, you definitely wanna to talk to um, an attorney or someone who's familiar with um, raising money by issuing securities. And so, you know, all these instruments, these are, these are securities. So, um, so that's, that's my presentation. Great, thank you very much, Andy. Um, in terms of who you see walking in the door these days and, and needing help at your firm, um, are you seeing a lot of people coming in worrying about what's the status of repayment of PPP or is it forming new businesses? Sort of what's your gut sense of, of, of what's hot right now in terms of, of people with new ventures? Yeah, I would say people with new ventures uh, is, has remained pretty constant, um, I think, in, in my experience over the past year. And for existing businesses, young businesses, or growing businesses that I've worked with, they've been raising money both to keep going, but also many of them to, to expand and to continue to work on their products or their services to develop them in a big way. I think almost, you know, if you didn't know the pandemic was going on, what I've seen in terms of businesses raising money um, has stayed the same or has increased in activity, I would say. Well, that's interesting, you know, because the general impression would be that everybody went into hiding. Um, right. But it's consistent with what we see in people just seeking advice. Right. Um, so actually that that's good news because you'd expect the pace to pick up now. And given what Brian just said about this is a good time to be raising money, um, you know, maybe we, we are really in for a boom. Um, yeah, I, 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 Gary, in terms of what we're seeing, I mean, it's we're not doing venture, but we are doing still capital investments. Um, we are, in terms of our deal flow, we're above 2019 rates right now. And we were, we were, we were about two thirds last year in terms of our deal flow and uh, compared to 2019. Now we're probably 125% of that. So there is absolutely people out there looking for money. Um, Andy, can I ask you a question in terms of AB5, the independent contractors, and yeah. how that relates to startups trying to find basically workforce? Is, is that slowing it down because in California, it's so hard to hire an independent contractor or not classify them as an employee, even though it might make sense for both the worker and the company to try to come to some independent contractor arrangement that might be on the fringes of AB5? That's a good sense. And I'm not a labor and employment lawyer, but from what I've seen working with companies who have to get services from people and pay them for it, um, I think people are spending more time just thinking about the issues and particularly uh, gig economy type workers. Uh, right. For instance, yeah, we, we did a deal with a company who employed a lot of those types of people so last year, early this year, they had to spend a lot of time thinking about uh, the new gig economy laws and how they're gonna have to transition in California uh, to a model that's compliant with, with the ways that you can hire people um, in a way that's compliant with um, the gig economy laws that, that Uber and um, uh, DoorDash and companies like that fought so hard to, to have um, some influence in, in, in their development. Um, so I think it's just taking up more mental bandwidth, but people are still providing services and, and getting them. 
I have a kind of a, a comment and a quick question. Uh, one what is, um, this is a reason kind of always to, I guess, engage or at least be discussing with law firms about, you know, what you need to grow your business, including, and there's a whole bunch of specialties in there, as Andrew mentioned, you know, there's the labor, there's what he does, and there's also IP. And recently there was a Supreme Court case on code and IP and, fit and copyright and fair use. So if you're doing any sort of software around that, you know, it's, it's good to engage with them. But my question is for Brian, um, how much does, uh, I guess, a company's uh, legal savviness impact your willingness to invest? So if there's a later stage company that maybe, you know, they're, they're creating a lot of revenue, but they haven't done all the, um, the standard kind of legal things of having a, 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 lot, a legal review or someone go through everything that they're doing, how does that impact your willingness to invest if they're still a revenue positive company? Yeah, I, significantly. I, it, in terms of when we go do due diligence, our due diligence like checklist is eight pages long. So the less things that you have on there that are question marks, the more we're going to pay for your company. So that's legal, that's accounting, that's finance, uh, that's supplier relationships, that's um, uh, customer relationships. So yes, you absolutely need to have all your legal stuff uh, buttoned up. We're going to come in, we're going to do our stuff, but I mean, it's just a sense of how well you're running your company to just to make sure that everything is is in line. So it's hugely important, but it's it's just as important as a, as a laundry list of other items in terms of how well your company is being run. So should I so I shouldn't submit that in a shoe box? <laughs> go go ahead. We'll we'll yeah. we'll take a uh, turn or two less on the EBITDA multiple when we make yeah, right. that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big discount factor there on the valuation. <laughs> and I think I want to get to some of the questions or that I see in here from Jario. Um, uh, Jario, are you still here? Uh, do you want to ask your questions that I see you put in the chat there? You can unmute you can ask them otherwise I'll paraphrase them. Um, you had a question about bonds that convert into common shares and warrants. Um, any yeah. commentary? Oh, yeah. there you go. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I was just following along with Andrew's presentation. Um, kind of just like um, when he was talking a little bit about the convertible notes and I was like, is that me? Is that like referring to convertible bonds that convert to like I guess common shares or like, I guess like I like that works and then um, I think another point where he was mentioning like I think it was like employee compensation for like stock options I guess or for employees I guess and I was like is that maybe something like warrants but no yeah I was just like kind of um, wondering along those lines like following along with Andrews. Well, they're, they're good things to wonder if you're trying to figure out how to compensate and fundraise for your company. But as you've probably gathered here, you know, it's, it's not um, always as straightforward as you would hope. Um, and you barely touched on or touched a little bit on securities and fundraising. Um, I, one thing that's been popular in the past year has been the crowdfunding of equity. Um, do you guys have any, I guess, kind of comments on that? Something that enables you to kind of get, you know, anyone off the street to invest in your company? Um, how do you, how does uh, CVS view companies that have used crowdfunding and uh, what have you seen on crowdfunding, Andrew? Sure. Uh, so so I'll, I, I'll start. I mean, in, in terms of if you're a startup, mm -hmm. any way you can get capital, particularly crowdfunding is, is positive. Um, so, if we're looking at an investment for us, it doesn't matter because we're going to be a couple of years down the road from that. We want to see some positive cash flow, but crowdfunding is a wonderful way to not only uh, do proof of concept in terms of are people going to buy your product, but also to fundraise without actually giving up a whole lot of equity. So uh, I think it's a very, very smart way to, uh, to fundraise early on in your venture. Yeah. That, uh... I would agree. I mean, there's some great success stories with uh, companies uh, building uh, products, like consumer products, as well as like creative um, works, like movies, uh, for through crowdfunding. Um, there's one. There's a big distinction: equity crowdfunding and just um, non-equity crowdfunding. And in the non-equity space, I guess typically. Um, you know, you raise money from the people contributing the money and the company 
instead of giving equity, like an equity ownership in the company, they give some thank you thing in recognition, like a t-shirt or the opportunity to buy the first, like a unit of the first product. Like I think the Pebble Watch was a big success story or um, you get credits at the end of a movie, for instance, or you get to attend a screening of the movie. When it comes to equity crowdfunding, um, the SEC has uh, put out, and the securities laws at the federal level do permit um, equity crowdfunding. There's um, a lot of requirements you have to meet um, for Reg CF, Reg crowdfunding. I believe you have to uh, go through an approved, an SEC approved funding portal, and uh, there's uh, strict limits on how much each investor can invest up to, I think, a $5,000 uh, dollar cap or um, some uh, lower amount uh, based on their net worth. And I think the, the portals do all the hard work of verifying um, the people's net worth and what they're investing and what they're buying. Um, so I haven't seen a whole lot of equity crowdfunding, honestly, um, ever. But um, I think companies might want to do it. They might want to do it to appear with it, to gain uh, even like grassroots support and, and to look like they're engaging with a broad base of fans slash customers. Um, on the downside for equity crowdfunding, um, it might be unattractive if you suddenly have a whole lot of investors that you might have to provide information to and uh, basically they have shareholder rights. So um, that, uh, that's one reason probably why on the equity side, it, it hasn't really taken off that, that much. It sounds like a whole lot more work potentially on it. Um, and another thing I, you know, I see a uh, startup founder charged with fraud. That's another thing. Don't lie, <laughs> lie about your business to people, especially when you're fundraising. Um, there's no shortage of people yeah. who have done that, fundraised a whole bunch and are looking at jail time. Yeah, Thomas, um, that's, that's a great point. I mean, um, and it's not just like no one, if you're a founder and you're listening to this, you're probably not planning to go out and lie to people just to take their money. But if the business, if the investment ends up going bad or the company doesn't end up taking off or taking off as fast as your investors would like, um, the, the main legal theory and recourse they're going to try to pursue against you is um, a, a securities fraud for claim, right. you know, which basically says you, you said something that was misleading to induce them to, for them to make, you, make them give you their money. Um, and that can, and if they don't have any like lies that they can point to, they'll try to say that you just overpromised. Um, so it's good to be conservative and to really, uh, you know, um, hedge your statements about your your expectations, your prospects for a future success. And yeah, and remember, you know, the reason that you set up a company is that if the company fails, you don't personally. So don't tie your future to that by lying and getting into securities fraud. Um, Gary, any last comments? Well, no, I just appreciate both what Brian and, and Andrew brought to the table today. It sounds like, you know, there's parts of these topics that we could spend the whole time on, and uh, particularly this last topic on crowdfunding. We now have had some companies in our clean tech community that have done pretty well on crowdfunding. Uh, Wind Harvest International is the top one I can think of. Um, and, you know, there are others that have tried and not done so well, but I, I think it's still a hot topic. Uh, very interesting, Brian, in terms of your whole perspective of, of what this means with the stimulus money and, and uh, what it's going to do to the economy, the, the uptick we're going to see, uh, very likely. Um, so great topic this morning. Thanks, everybody. Round of applause for our presenters and everybody who's participated. So, Thomas, let's just... Uh, I'll right. toss it back to you to, to wrap up for the morning. All right. I want to thank our sponsors again, Smud, Weintraub, Tobin, Sac State, Moss Adams, and Blue Tech Valley. I also want to thank all of you for attending. And remember to check out the upcoming perspectives with Grid SME and Mineta in May. 
I'm excited about the Grid SME one because if you're building a product and you haven't thought about security or where you're sourcing your products, that is a major issue if you're going to start competing for any of those government grants or any utility, um, any entail, entail, uh, utility RFPs. I also have additional thanks to our overall program spar partners and our community of par and our community of partners. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and end the recording and thank everyone for attending. Um, very much appreciate it and a special thank.